data. Um, I'm going to take a kind of a, a pitch on it that of what we've been doing at, at Esri since I've been there for about uh, two years. Uh, previously, I was CTO of GeoCommons, where we were focusing on uh, building a crowdsourced open geospatial repository in which people had to go and find data, scrape it, and contribute it to, essentially to us. We had pretty good uh, results of that. Um, to date, I think there's over 300,000 data sets that have been crowdsourced, obviously to varying level of qualities, maintenance, sustainability. And what we learned from that was that, one, there's a, a, a huge drive for doing it. There's a lot, uh, a lot of people that want to share data and have data made accessible and available in a lot of different formats. Two, that the data on the web are crazy and wild and change format a lot. Um, a lot of handwritten XML and JSON out there. It's surprising when you talk to OGC about that. Like, no, no, everyone uses an XSLT or you know, verification document. No. They write their uh, KML and PHP by hand, and you hope you can parse it. Um, and so it's pretty crazy and wild up there. And just over time, it's, if the, you don't have the owner involved in sharing the data, it's just not going to be sustainable. So what we've been doing is, is trying to do a lot of things in Esri since we joined here is in terms of really making the platform um, that's used pretty much across the majority of government institutions and a lot of other uh, corporate organizations make it more easy and accessible uh, through a lot of different ways. So relevant to this panel, I think, in location uh, tech is, is the open source aspect of it, which is definitely something people aren't used to when they hear about Esri. Um, a lot of people are critical or skeptical of, um, but I'll tell you, it's for real. Um, and we're really changing how we work. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things that have been changing at Esri, so there's a lot of reasons why there's a lot of meat behind this, but also, hey, hold us to what actually happens, not what we're saying. So we have four different initiatives. I'm not, I'm not gonna go through all of them here, but we are heading up um, open source uh, initiative, as well as better open standards, so the ones that you have to check the box, but also the ones that everyone actually uses, because sometimes those are different things. Um, open data that I'll drive into a lot here, and then a lot of open content. All of our education materials is all released under Creative Commons, uh, share alike license, um, or attribution, I think, only. Um, a lot of our algorithms documentation are all openly accessible as well. Um, a lot of other data and information we have are out there are, have been accessible for years. And we're trying to really highlight and find out what other people want. So we're all an open source and just kind of get what, what's been going on here is first we've been doing open source for years, I mean, way before I was at Esri, but not, there were like two or three projects in SourceForge and CodePlex and places that weren't as popular um, today. So we converged everything to GitHub. And when we started two years ago on this particular initiative, there were zero projects in Esri's GitHub account. Um, and there were maybe one or two people as part of the org. Um, to date, after, this is actually from about a month or two ago, there are 17, 718 Esri engineers, Esri employees that are now part of our GitHub organization. Um, in terms of they are, maybe they were on GitHub or we've kind of brought them to GitHub and exposed them to what that means. Um, in terms of being able to, you know, collaboratively work on code in the public. Um, they're also, we leverage GitHub internally um, as well for all of our core products as well. So we're really changing how we collaborate and making this really part of the way we do business. Um, we have over 300 open source repositories, over 3,000 forks, um, which is just the beginning of getting into some of the metrics in terms of where we've done it. We've published it, that's great. But why is it more than a marketing exercise? How do we actually change how people feed back on this? And again, I won't dive into too much here, but it does underpin some of the things we're thinking about is how do we leverage tools and give tools to people to enable them to be flexible, to really solve the problem that they have, are an expert at and not worry about the rest of the things they don't want to deal with, right? Really focus on those things. For example, one of the first things we actually open sourced, which was kind of amazing, was one of our core geometry engines. So you can go and download for free under an Apache license so it's more open licensed than the um, JTS that was out there. A geometry engine, which you can now go and deploy across a thousand machines and never ever talk to us as a company again. Because it's just a really good, really fast core geometry engine. Because we wanted to enable people to go and explore doing big data analytics. What happens when they want to go and analyze you know, agriculture regions across the world, we don't want them to have to buy thousands of licenses. Here, take this geometry engine. We're even building um, Hive and um, other spatial query engines on top of it, Pig. Enable it really easy for people to deploy this and then leverage it either back in our platform or just take and go and build their own applications with it. Similarly, we've been building client-side data transformation engines like Terraformer. We've been integrating into popular other libraries like Leaflet. So if someone wants to use Leaflet instead, great. We can help you, we'll actually help you do that and help you work in what you're most comfortable using. Um, GeoPortal has been one of those that's been out there for several years, I think eight years. Uh, that has been open sourced. Um, in terms of being able to do metadata standards, CSW, all of the OGC tick boxes. That's an open source application that's been very popular and deployed pretty widely. Um, and then Coop, I'll actually will dive into here. It powers some of the magic behind what we're doing with open data. So this is a way to think about it is, is this is the, the part that everyone has seen and usually trusts and pays for and gets trained up on and things like that. But what we're doing now is we're open sourcing all these pieces around it. Right? We're letting people really go and build 
a lot of capability without ever talking to us. They can go and build com almost completely open stacks, or essentially open stacks here. They can have data processing engines to databases to, pro to um, visualization engines to even ways to manage your SSH keys across EC2. Um, most open source co companies, when they go open source, open source things that support their, their core business. We're actually open sourcing parts of our core business to enable some of the domain expertise that exists out there. So why? Why are we doing this? Um, what's really interesting is sometimes when I decouple or, or decompose what ESRI stands for, um, and, and, and even in the Environmental Systems Research Institute, it's really about enabling people to understand location geography, enabling to them to understand that and improve their own lives. You know, as Jack Dangerman, I was amazed when I found this quote, and it was attributed to Jack a number of years ago, the technology is bringing people closer to their worlds and empowering them to define a future that reflects their values, hopes, and dreams. So we can talk and get all wonky about technology and, and formats and tools and things like that. But in the end, these people live on the street. It's where the kids will grow up. It's where they're worried about crime and air quality, house prices, um, transport, how they're getting to work every day, who their neighbors are. How do we empower them to have the most capability and understanding and, and really ownership of their space around them? Of How do they become active participating citizens? How do they become active participating, engaging with science and climate change? Kind of how do we make open data part of the infrastructure? Like we provide a road, like the city provides this basic infrastructure and doesn't presume what's going to go across that road, but that the road's always there and the citizens and the businesses and the developers can trust that the road will always be there. And now I'm going to put different trucks and vans and trains and things like along that and the city's going to maintain that for me. So that gets into what we're really trying to do with, with this open data initiative um, from Esri and, and hopefully collaborate with other people. So it's great. So it's about government providing tools for their citizens. That's, that's what I really think and is valuable, right? But then why are you here as a business? Why are we all wearing jackets and talking about this as well? There's a greater potential here. So you're probably familiar with, if you're not, I highly recommend going and reading it, the recent McKinsey Global Institute report that came out, I think, last October, which highlighted the potential for open data for business value um, and realization. They highlighted six major sectors and about two subsectors um, where open data is going to have a tremendous impact over the near future. So how do things like natural resources, health, education, transport, right? So a lot of these different sectors that we kind of know and, and can think about and kind of you know, understand that, yes, I can see how, how open data helps those. And then relevant to everyone in this room, at least, it's not always the case when we, I talk to groups, but you get it, that location is this common underpinning behind all of these sectors. How do you understand how they're related to one another? What at least the correlations and potentially causations in terms of how you address things like health through better transportation, through better education? How do you use natural resources to improve utilities? Or, or there's another meeting just down the hallway about um, energy efficiency, right? And how can our concepts and technology all together as a community enable those businesses to operate better? Because again, what gets really interesting is this is a $3 trillion market per year, globally. The ability to leverage open data to improve business processes, to make better decisions, to be more efficient, to engage citizens to, to live better lives is a huge business opportunity as much as it is about just improving overall society. So how do we build that public square? How do we help governments and organizations to go and build a public square in which people will come and live and hang out? Right? It's not about saying, I'm going to build something, I have to have you come into my building, like a museum or, or some other um, esoteric thing which you have to go to, but how does this become part of what I walk by? How do I get people to hang out there so it attracts more businesses to talk to the citizens? How do it get more citizens to show up? How do we then encourage more infrastructure to build that out? And really, what it's not a hard thing to do. It's being part of the web. This is actually going back when, the, in the beginning of the whole Gov 2.0, eGov uh, hype, um, is actually what Gartner cited it as in 2007, in which they said web oriented architectures have a much greater potential effect on the ability to transform government than anything else in the Web 2.0 world. It's not necessarily about bi directional, it's not about rounded corners or bubbly gradients or things like that. It's about just leveraging what the web's very good at. The web came out of a research institute, which was meant to enable the open sharing of science data. That's what really kicked off the web, and that's really what the underpinning and what we have the opportunity to do. So it's people talk about not having silos. It's really actually not about just not having silos, but actually leveraging the fabric of the infrastructure of the web that's out there. So we thought about this in four different ways um, in terms of the core principles we're always keep thinking about. It's making data discoverable. People usually are going to go to their pop most popular search engine to find data. They're not going to come to your site or your portal or your organization. They're going to say, water quality in the Chesapeake, right, in a search engine, and hopefully these things show up. It's not just a way to go and get some advertising or some water testing kit. They can actually go learn about what's really going on and explore that data and information. They can make it explorable, so once they find it, they can actually do something with it. It's not just, here's a link, go drop into your favorite NetCDF desktop app. 
Like, I don't know what that means. I'm on the web, let me leverage the web to play with and explore this data right away. Make it accessible um, in, terms of, in terms of easily understandable, in terms of terminology and vocabulary. People don't know what things like NetCDF are. They probably don't know what services even really are and mean. That means like 311 maybe. Maybe it means like the service at my local restaurant. Um, let's talk to them in the, in the vernacular they understand. They're, they're experts in what they do, not in what we build. So let's make sure our technology speaks to them in the way they work. And then um, and make them in open formats, and then also make it collaborative. Make these things bi-directional. Engage collaboratively here. Um, citizens are really want to engage. We've had a lot of uh, uh, proof points where open collaboration and feedback systems around geospatial data have been extremely successful. Something we've talked about a lot is making it one-click downloadable. None of these forms and disclaimers and you know, give me your email address, click, go in common formats. And again, as I mentioned, creating positive feedback loops. So, you know, open government, open data has not, not necessarily a new thing. It's been going on for quite a while. Um, in fact, DC, where we're in, had one of the first pretty good uh, web uh, open data catalogs. You go to data.dc.gov, really easy to remember URL. Um, I could always just type this in. I didn't have to remember something weird and esoteric. Just gave me lists of data. It was great. Dove into it, a lot of different formats. But the problem is, and if you can see the screen at all, is that while the top data sets are on crime, some of the live data sets are well maintained. The ones that are not live, have become dramatically, out, drastically out of date. Last updated 2012, 2011, 2007 um, for human service locations. I have a pretty good feeling that something's happened in the city. Um, DC's changing pretty dramatically in a positive way that the data uh, is out of date and inaccurate at this point, right? But the problem is they've separated themselves from how they publish the data from how they maintain the data. And where that hasn't been, where they actually maintain the open data with their services, for example, the crime data, it's very up to date. And when their database went down, citizens and developers knew. And so it's an example of how do we make those things live to those core connection points. So come back to this project I, didn't, I briefly hovered over. This is a project called Coop, where we have ArcGIS server, in our case, where it's being deployed pretty widely, again, across all levels of government. And that's great. And people can already leverage that. But we also wanted a way to do um, simple export and transforms of that data into different formats, into different common formats as well as leverage connecting two other types of data sources, which I'll highlight in a second. I don't see Ben here, but I'm going to steal a little bit of his thunder um, in terms of how we can even connect to GitHub. It's, the premise here is don't move your data. Keep your data where it is, maintain it the way you maintain it, and then we'll help you um, share it out. So we do this is we leverage the fact that organizations have their databases, and then we can leverage in, in a click of a button deploy an open data application, which exposes out to the web in web-aligned ways, in which citizens can then, then come and do a, a basic search on the web, they can, businesses can explore data sets and developers can discover APIs. And people can operate all around the same core data without moving the data around constantly. Just where it lives and resides, exposing on all these different interfaces depending on who the user is. So I'll show you just kind of a quick highlight of what this actually looks like. That's always a lot more fun. So we've been working with a number of institutions to start already sharing their data um, that, that's powered here. So, this is one we've highlighted a lot. It's Data Driven Detroit. It's a small NGO that wanted to share data to help a city, which is, to be honest, having a little bit of trouble helping itself. A lot of very empowered citizens are trying to work and improve the government, but really have to take their own ownership. This is an organization that could do that very easily. They can go and um, spin up a site. Uh, you can go and search for schools and education data sets. So I can go and find um, different data they've uploaded. So I can go, for example, and dive into Detroit schools, where they're all located. Explore the data. So things we talk about like metadata. Um, we don't really, we have one link here that says metadata, but just kind of saying who provided it? When did they provide it? Very common vernacular for these things. If you don't like this data set, here's other recommended data sets. Kind of apply the shopping cart concept. People are familiar with Amazon. Um, you know, if you, liked, if you liked schools, you might also like parks. Um, but make it you know, easy for people to go and grab, click download, grab a spreadsheet, and they're done. Right? Or they can also grab KML files, they'll pull it into their favorite 3D globe viewer, shape files, which are popular. And then API is GeoJSON, people love the D3 now. Um, or GeoService, if they want to go and do other GIS and processing workflows. So that's cool, but that's great, but that's a little bit kind of like a glorified FTP. How do we still make things explorable? So people can pull up a table view. We found out very, very quickly that people like to view tables of things, they get it. In fact, it's different, maybe an alphabet Esri, but you know what? The, ta the map might be optional. Just because it's geographic doesn't mean it's cartographic. But needless to say is that people like and can understand this. They can look at, at the school data, the spreadsheet data. Um, they can go and uh, look through different zip codes. So for example, um, I want to just download to, let me just zoom into this one, 408201, this one zip code. 
I now have eight schools here um, in, this, in this one area in downtown Detroit. Um, I can view just these features. I can then go and download just this data set. Right? So right away, people are able to explore the data without having to leave the browser, having to even know Excel, let alone a GIS. Um, download that out and now go run with it. Um, and even possibly subscribe to it if there's any updates to these data sets. Um, they can also go and embed this into Facebook and Flickr um, and to Twitter. So embedding into tools they're already using. And then kind of behind the scenes, some things we're doing that are subtle and we're really interested in exploring with other people is that each feature itself has a durable URL. So what does it mean when now the city is maintaining the canonical database of all schools that has a durable URL and now everyone can point to and link to? What might that mean to in terms of the, maybe the emergence finally of the semantic web? So that's just a few examples of things we're doing. We're seeing thing, uh, organizations like the Forest Service use this. We're seeing um, DC use this. So this is an example of instead of those static FTP sites, is the ability for them to go and quickly maintain, deploy this, and over time keep updating um, all of these data sets. So it's not just about uploading FTP sites, but it's about them maintaining and working the data workflows they understand and, and do, um, and then making these available without then having to do really any more work, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, uh, Maryland, and then this is an example um, where I mentioned about right now, this is assuming everyone's using ArcGIS, which is a lot, um, and a lot of data is maintained there, but not all data is maintained there. And just as much as I said about not taking data out of the database, if it's already existing and has a workflow somewhere, great. Keep it there. Keep those workflows. Keep the data timely and up-to-date and accurate. So City of Philadelphia um, is maintaining their data, some of their data in GitHub. Awesome. Cool. If they got a workflow, cool. So we've used this Coop project that can actually link to GitHub and pull this data out and bring it in as a service. So now I'm linking from instead of this GeoJSON file or the CSV file, which I'll leave Ben to kind of show some of the really awesome tools GitHub's done. I can now bring it into the same interface. I can go and download this and back out now as a spreadsheet KML or shapefile. Um, so it does this conversion. So maybe they uploaded it as, as GeoJSON or something else, but I want other formats back out. Um, <laughs> people that want to go and view a table and have these other ways to explore the data, filter it down, um, do different things with it, can bring this in, keeps the data where it's at, and pulls it out live. Um, and that's kind of what this Coop project does. It just really is a, is a big web proxy um, for APIs, and it's all open source, so go crazy with it. So that's just a, a few examples. I think I'm, I have time my quick 15 minutes. So my point is here is stop moving the data. Right? It's burdensome, it's unsustainable, it's going to get broken. Um, instead, you know, play with the pieces. You know, see what you can build by, 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 by pulling them together and all these loosely, loosely coupled pieces. Pull them together, build things, and, and share them freely. So thank you, everyone. Look forward to more Q&A.